<clears throat> hey, good morning, fellas. This is Ken of Tortoise Capital. This is the Foundation's check-in for July 9th, 2023. Uh, let's do a quick around the horn and just see how guys are doing. Uh, Lou, good to see you. Uh, welcome aboard. You know, the the adventure continues, the adventure begins. How are you doing this morning? Thank you. Good. Uh, Hamad, how's the little one? You getting any sleep? Uh, getting plenty. I've got my mother-in-law staying with us, so <laughs> he's a good set. <clears throat> Yeah, you, um, you say that like that's a happy thing. Uh, what a nice... <laughs> I never understood the problem people had with, with uh, mother-in-laws. Mine was just the sweetest one ever. We, we loved her. You said it right, Ken. Marry well, right? That's right. You get that one right, the rest of it falls into place. Rad, how are you doing today? All good, thank you. Good to hear. And Molland, what's up with you, sir? I am good. I'm good. I'm finally getting into grooves. It almost feels like, a, you know, almost like a learning to walk again. That's the thing. When you're in the middle of something, uh, something new, and then you kind of have an abrupt break, it's an interesting journey to get back in the pedestal. But I'm enjoying it. Uh, that's going to be the theme of today, is that proper learning that lasts is disruptive. That's how, that's how you know that you're making fundamental changes at a deep level. Without that sense of disruption, then you're not committed to fully learning the new idea at a deep level. You're kind of dabbling at the surface, but you're not allowing it to come in and shift anything else that you're doing. You're right. looking, it's like a bumper sticker. Hey, could I just put this bumper sticker on and everything would be okay? Can I just take this magic pill every morning and get a, and then have perfect health so I don't have to change anything? <laughs> but if you are if you're working at a deep level, you're down there tweaking fundamental assumptions and principles and identity and processes mm -hmm. and putting on new lenses. Right. It really and is I, like learning have to walk all over you and know. and I, I honestly well realized I was telling this to guys yesterday, Ken, that with your uh, your ecosystem, the wisdom and the nuggets come almost from any time, any direction, anything mm -hmm. that you are doing. Sometimes it comes in one of those daily ones. Uh, yeah. So I, I never know what hits me in, the, in moments. So. Well, you and me both, because I've never actually said that before about deep learning versus surface learning as a disruptive force. It wasn't really until you said it exactly that way that that clicked and the new way to say it uh, hit me. It's funny because I was having exactly that discussion earlier this week in a advanced faculty development program. We go through a five-year recertification with our faculty uh, in order to keep teaching. And we brought in some guys from the reserve component who are full-time, you know, employed somewhere, but also serving in the Army National Guard and Reserve. And their reserve and guard job is to teach the same course that I teach for the Army, but to do it on weekends and evenings with uh, officers who are in the Guard and Reserve. And we teach about uh, 1,100 or 1,200 officers in resident every year, uh, which includes about 200 international officers from 150 different countries who send us their best and brightest to work with us as part of our allied and outreach program. Some amazing guys come from that pool, men who have gone on to become presidents of their nation, chiefs mm. of defense, uh, general officers. So we get an amazing assortment of guys in that school from every culture and language and background and perspective. And the learning opportunity for me is off the chart good. I would also say that we get 1,200 here, but another 2,000 Army officers take it through distance learning 
who are in the active component, but another 5,000 officers take it through that reserve and the guard. So most of the people take our course as taught by guys who are doing it as an additional duty mm. as, as part of their service obligation. So they send their experienced guys to us during this advanced faculty certification, and then we put in guys that have been teaching at least five years. That's the fourth time I've taken it. So we had seven faculty from our school, including me, and we had approximately 250 years of experience of teaching that course together. So we had some legends of the game inside that room. And the practical demonstration of technique that I gave had to do with the idea of golden nuggets and why it's so important to learn one thing every day that's worth $1,000 because it cost us a thousand dollars a day to bring an officer to our school for a whole year yeah. and the reason we do that uh, is because we think that the return on education the compounded return on education is astronomical compared to just leaving them in the force at their current level for one more year of production right the average officer that we get serves for 10 years more before they retire. So why does it make sense to take a year out of their career, teach them things, and then only give them nine years of performance? So I'll ask you, how much better do they have to be at the end of year of education at the break-even point for the year of production that they lost? the year the at least at least one one ninth for sure well here's how, here's how you do that the rule of 72 huh. so you i have to i have to double my performance hmm. i take whatever my return my compounded return is and divide it into 72 and that tells you how many years it takes to double so if i want to be twice as good at the end of 10 years uh, I, it cost me about seven uh, percent improvement. Compounded for ten years, I get to seventy-two. If I only have nine years, and I have to be eight percent better, so that means uh, because then an eight percent compounded for nine years gets me to seventy-two, and that's when I double. So the break-even point is they have to be. This is the difference between. 7% compounded annually and 8% compounded annually. That's why you do that. So a 1% improvement on 7% is 14% approximately. So right. they have to leave my school 14% better at the end of a year in order to expect a compounded return on education that was, makes it worthwhile. So now I can frame that trade as it costs me $250,000 a year to bring an, a student here. I did the math on that in two ways. The first one, and I did the study 10 years ago, I said their average annual income was, at that time was 85000 a year. So if that's the direct cost, you use a planning factor of two to one for indirect cost, and that gets you to 250000 So the indirect costs are all the other things that you have to spend in support, things like the cost of transportation to move them, cost of housing, the cost of retirement contributions, health care, running schools for their children. Some of those things are sunk costs, like I have to do those wherever they are, but that's all part of having an, a major on active duty for a year. So it's $250,000 it cost me. So that was my back of the envelope. So I contacted the headquarters Department of Army Resource Management Office and I laid out the research question and I said, I want to know the fully burdened cost of having an officer, a major, in the Army for a year. And they came back a week later with an itemized list of all the money that are spent on all majors, prorated for all the functions across the Army budget, and the answer was $250,000, which it both surprised me and then it didn't surprise me at all. <coughs> 
So they're here for a year. So that's 50 weeks. They get two weeks vacation. 50 weeks of five days a week. So that's 250 days. So how nice does that work out? I have $250,000 spread over 250 days. That's $1,000 a day. At the time 10 years ago, gold, an ounce of gold, wait for it, was worth $1,000. Mm. Done. Done. So I said, clearly, <laughs> the things that you have to learn every day are a golden ounce, a golden nugget. And I asked, the, so then I tell the boys and girls, I said, now, what does an ounce of gold look like just before you start to get it? It looks like 10 cubic yards of earth. Not just any old earth, but earth that you have reason to believe is populated with economically recoverable amounts of gold. Let me put it that way, because there's a cost mm -hmm. of getting that gold. And the cost of the gold you get should cover your operating costs, the carry rate. So to get gold, you have to find gold-enriched ground, which you get by sampling and drilling to see if there's enough gold in the sample to justify industrial operations. So once you do that, you go where gold can be found, you sample, and then you decide if it's worth investing the time and the money for the overhead to set up your mining operation. So the point is that to get gold, you don't just find it, you got to extract it, and the way you extract it is by removing all the things that are not gold from that 10 cubic yards of dirt. So there is some active work that's required, but you need to know that you're in the territory. You're in the neighborhood of gold. There's reason to believe that there's gold in that dirt. So you sample and you check it out, you scout. That whole story came into my mind because one day I walked into the classroom at 10 o'clock in the morning and one of my students was an army lawyer, a female, who's a prosecutor, who in her 10-year career had never lost a case. She's amazing. And it was February, and they were performing training on a simulation exercise, and her role was to be the higher headquarters media relations person, and she was writing some kind of press release to announce to the world about that day's operation. And I said to her, as she's sitting there monkeying around with the PowerPoint slide and words on a page, I said, what have you learned today? And she said, nothing. I'm just marking time. I'm just being busy until they give me something to work with. And as a taxpayer, I was outraged that I had a person of this caliber, and I had just gone through the math in my head on the golden nugget speech because I'd been thinking about it for a while and I told her I stopped the class and I told everybody now listen here's the new rule if by 12 o'clock on any day you haven't learned something that in your view is worth a thousand dollars you come find me and as a taxpayer I am either going to give you something to think about that's worth a thousand dollars or I'm going to torture you with shame, sarcasm, and humiliation and humor so that you suffer, so that as a taxpayer, I feel like we got our money's worth for, from you for that day. Because the thousand dollars that it takes to put me, uh, to put you into that seat is money that my nation taxes from the retirement counts of my parents. So I'm not in here to kiss your butt and be your friend. I am here working on behalf of the nation to ensure that we're getting value for the cost. And I'm trusting you guys as stewards of the nation to determine if what you're doing, you know, you're doing what we ask you to do. If we're asking you to do things that are not worth a thousand dollars of learning each day, 
then you should be outraged. You shouldn't sit there and take that. You should be saying, why are you wasting my time? And if you come to me and tell me that I'm wasting your time, I'm going to say, I can't waste your time because it's your time. Only you can waste your time. And if you are that disrespectful about the value of your own time that you allow somebody else to waste it for you and you accept that, then there's something wrong with the way that you're looking at yourself and the value of your time. Because of all the things that are renewable, that ain't one of them. And I'm looking right at a guy with a brand new baby girl. Once you spend that time, it is gone. And when that's gone, it ain't coming back. And so part of my effort this weekend was to say, looking at my office and saying, if I die tomorrow, what do I want my kids to do with all of this stuff? And everything that I don't want them to keep, I am donating to somebody that can use it, like books, college courses, etc., equipment, spare clothes, shoes, so that my kids don't have to do that and think about me with everything that they touch as they decide what to do with dad's stuff. So I'm not going to have that. Mm -hmm. So I say all that to say, if, if you are older or younger than me, if you aren't getting a prostate check every year, then I don't know what's wrong with you because it doesn't cost hardly anything and you can find out early if you need to intervene on the number one killer of all men, prostate mm -hmm. cancer. So you better fix that. If you haven't taken it yet, you better fix that. And then think about what the Stoics say. Memento mori. Remember you're going to die. Start every day remembering that and say, now, with that in mind, how am I going to spend the remaining time that I have starting with today? So be a serious person and don't work on things that don't matter. Be serious about the things that you're working on. Fully commit to them and embrace them and do all those things. But don't work on things that don't matter. Don't be trivial. Yeah. Well, uh, that Golden Nugget speech is the number one speech that I give to every incoming class the first day that I meet them. And it's the first thing that I teach to the new faculty members who come in who haven't been faculty before and are spending all their time, properly so, I guess, to make sure that they can teach the things that they are required to teach so that these officers can go out and succeed. And sometimes the pursuit of detail on technical training can blind you to the memory that, oh, yeah, the things that matter really do matter and that you have to get the big ones right first. That lets you work on the other things as you need to. So I wanted to say that. No, that's, that's good, Gim. Mean, I, uh, anyway, I wanted to thank you for putting that in my head. Yeah, and, no. And there are a few, few more things as I was listening to you came up. But I know you have a prepared material, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to hold that thought, write down in an email, and then we can talk about it on the next one. That's how you do it. And I'm going to show you how Hamad did that today. I also wanted to share uh, something from a former student of mine from 10 years ago. This is the teaser, because we're going to get to Chin Long and Greg and Jeff. So this was a guy on the right-hand side of the screen, Matt, who was a PhD in biology and a practicing corporate tax lawyer who had learned about some of my material from a guy who managed his money who was a student of mine and a graduate of VTI. And he started coming to the research weekends annually and in the last 10 years, he has set aside his corporate tax practice, is now a registered investment advisor, running his own business for four years, partnering with one of the legends in 
the business and will probably take over his money management firm and simply sent me an update on the right-hand side of the systems that he developed during our research weekend that he's now using with clients, some of whom are retired Army officers who used to teach with me and who were looking for alternative ways to manage their money. And so uh, at great risk to my own peace of mind, I connected them with Matt. I want to talk about having skin in the game. <laughs> And this is his latest update, and he just let me know that um, he's on board for our this year's annual research weekend, and he's going to make some presentations on the things you see on the right-hand side, which are pretty darn good. And his work is connected exactly to the question that Hamad asked me. On the right-hand side, you see what can happen with the compounded return on education if you approach it in a serious way as a 10-year journey, and then that will help guide the answer that I'm going to give to Hamad about his question about improving consistency in trading results. So we're going to get to that in a short minute after I ask Chun Long how he's doing and what's up. Yeah, I'm doing good. Very well, whether I enjoy doing the credit to <clears throat> lesson, which is a, another QE recorded probably more than a year ago. You talk about a guy grinding, grinding 18 months and uh, get it, blow it. I just think about that guy to be me. Uh, I look at the good part, get it, I don't blow it. I hope. And good morning, Jeff. Fighting fires on our nation's wilderness. Yeah, good morning, guys. Yeah, I feel great this morning. It's the first morning in 12 days that I haven't had to get up and go to work. So I slept an extra hour, and that's just fantastic. But I'm just doing some work here, and I thought I'd listen to you guys and see what was going on. Awesome. And Greg, bring us home. Things are good. I'm how do I follow all of that? Everything's doing well, and uh, um, looking forward to continuing and learning more. Thanks, Ken. Uh, my final part of the check-in. My brother's on his way to the house from Michigan with his big old truck, and he's going to take home about fifty different war games that I have from my personal collection of the last fifty years, and about thirty drums and percussion instruments, and he's going to sell the war games and he's going to donate the drums to a uh, special ed um, uh, child development organization that uses kinesthetic learning for the kids on developing skills and they're in need of some percussion instruments and I'm in need of ensuring that my drums go to a place where they will be played and uh, so that um, I'm probably gonna give him a giant library of trading books you know I took I, I took a bunch of books down to half price book and they were giving me about a penny on the dollar it keeps him out of the landfill but I just don't feel like that's an appropriate destination for all my trading books so I'm gonna put a separate collection of those together for him because uh, he's enjoying this stuff. And uh, he may be helping my nephew acquire some knowledge in this area. He's an actuary, mathematically oriented and ready to go. So I'll be putting together a bunch of those books, all of which I've read. And uh, that's why letting them go was so hard, but I realized that they needed to be in a place where they could continue to do good. So that's how you learn to let go. Uh, I can commend to you the mind the uh, mindset of Marie Kondo, uh, who is the gal who does uh, tidying up Marie Kondo. Her stuff works. You put all your stuff in a pile, you touch it, and you, if it doesn't spark joy, you donate it. The problem I had was that all my books sparked joy, so how do I get rid of them? Oh, I imagine where they're going to end up 
And the joy that I get by having them in that new place doing good was more than the joy of holding on to it, especially when I compare it to the lack of joy of thinking about my kids having to dispose of my stuff. So that made it very easy to let go. Marie Kondo's work is excellent if you need to get to the heart of things. All right, so here's what, uh, here's, we're ready to go. Here's what uh, Matt told me about. He's got a system called QBAT, which was up 24% in second quarter. A smaller version of that that has unleveraged uh, was up over 12%. And then he does one where he has a QBAT, and then this other one is a conservative interest-generating account. That was also up just under 12% in a quarter. This was the important one. Buy and hold and other momentum systems were anywhere from minus 1 to plus 3 in that same period of time. So the alpha is significant. His partner Gary is going to write a new book on momentum uh, and will incorporate a lot of Matt's work. Uh, he committed to doing a presentation on these systems at the next research weekend. I'm, I'm going to be collecting their presentations and do coaching with them and peer review in uh, October. I think we should have all that stuff delivered. Uh, and then in the options portfolio, he earned 15% in Q2 after fees and is up 35% year to date. And Kay is one of, is used to be my teaching partner who retired and I put her in contact with him. Now he put together that options spread strategy after taking Danny Ben Yair's options course, which he did for us which connects the mechanical swing systems to option strategies that Danny uses. Danny's a super trader and is a hedge fund manager for 30 years and uses options on my systems and his course is designed for options players who want to combine. It's the only options course in the world that can say that and this is what Matt's doing with that. So I wanted to say that about the uh, research weekend. Now here's how I structure that. All the guys who have been working with me for 10 years and been coached by me, I invite them to come do their annual coaching. And uh, so these, you know, the guys that have been with me for 10 years or so, they do a 20 minute or so presentation. They write a paper and make a presentation. I put two people who are taking the workshop as peer reviewers and then that group of three work together to make that the best possible presentation. Then I give peer review and then everybody else in the audience who is attending gives peer review and we record all of that and then that becomes a package for each one of those. So I got about 10 guys coming who have um, guys, Phil and Griff and Luke and my brother and three or four pro money managers like Matt are coming together already committed to doing this. I also uh, allow for, whoops, I also have uh, students who are ready to make presentations on their materials uh, come in and, um, now why is that not letting me clear? There we go. Uh, who are ready to make their, like I would call it, blue belt presentations, like Luke and Ken Hum and guys who have been working through creativity and foundations and have you know, 500 trades documented under their belt and are ready for a large system review. Uh, you can see examples of that. So those guys get to make presentations as well. I also open this up to folks who just want to listen or and or do the participation by peer review uh, at a fee. Uh, it's going to be $4.99 this year, I've decided, for the 
initial folks who are foundations students or graduates they get a discounted rate people who have not taken any of my material uh, I typically charge 1500 bucks for people just to get the recordings so if you're interested in doing a paper or you just want to get access to the recordings and you're in the sound of my voice that's that'll be your price if you want to make a presentation it won't cost you any more but you are going to get a boatload of coaching both from the peer reviewers and from me and from all the other guys who are listening to the presentation it's uh that's how that's why it's like a blue belt test you got to get in there and fight so i don't charge you anything for the coaching because you're you're doing a lot of good work and i want to respect the effort so anyway, that's uh, that's coming in October, and it really takes probably two months for you to go through all the materials and really make sure that you're listening carefully with all of them, because that once you do that, we let you, you know, just contact the guys and do follow-up Q&A. And oh, by the way, when you do that, you get access to previous year's uh, presentations and recordings so I don't know of a better value in terms of practical applied learning than that by the guys who are doing the work which leads me to the next point which is uh, Hamad asks a great question how can I achieve consistency in trading results I have been struggling with getting any consistency in my performance and to go back to the first statement that's how I know that you're doing it right because if this is your solid base your foundations down here in your roots if that's the part that's under the ground and you're making fundamental shifts down in here that's gonna make this start to wobble a little bit And the fact that you're struggling means that you're actually taking ideas and concepts, bringing it in at the root level, and you're allowing yourself the risk of trying on genuinely new things with your A game. And that's different than if you just had this as a bumper sticker and said, hey, uh, let me try to just slap this on the surface and maybe the fact of doing that is going to give me tremendous performance and then I won't have to do anything different except put a bumper sticker on there. Tell me if anything transformative or significant in life ever happened by doing that. Now maybe, just not in trading. So by slapping a bumper, so imagine you went to a a two-day workshop over a weekend and you listen to a bunch of ideas and a guy gave you a bunch of rules and you just slapped it on and you tried it a couple times and your numbers didn't look like his numbers and you say well that didn't work let me let me try tweaking this and tweaking that and changing this and changing that okay didn't work so you discard the whole thing and then now what you're doing is uh, you're operating from your base and you're trying all these external quick fixes. Can I do a quick fix and then make it and then get performance but without changing anything foundational in my base camp and where I'm doing? That to me doesn't make sense. Uh, most things where I'm working at a professional level with the idea of doing 5, 10, 15, 20 years of sustained effort is never fixed with a bumper sticker. If I were to abbreviate bumper sticker, I might just call it BS so that it could fit inside that little box. So bumper, when you see BS, just think bumper sticker. That's how I want you to think of BS.
so if instead what we think about is I've got this terrain that I've decided and I've established an area in which I want to be excellent, the first thing that I got to do is get my scouts out to explore. And that means I, I run over here and I check that out. Is, is there gold in there? If there is, if I immediately go into production and I neglect all of the all of this other bound all of this other space over here, then I hope that my first choice to dig uh, was above average compared to all the other places that are there. Because as soon as I go into production, what it takes for me to go into production is a much heavier investment in time and infrastructure and money and attention and focus and commitment than it takes to rapidly scout. So there are two different functions. When I'm scouting, I've got to emerge from my base camp and I've got to expand my view. I've got to explore that space rapidly I got to generate artifacts like lab reports and say I tried these five different things and I rack and step this was the best and that was the five and three and four and one and now I have a prioritized list of things to work on having conducted my survey of what is available now if that's the place to go then that's the place to go but I also bring in the comfort and the calmitude of saying I don't have opportunity costs for other things. I don't have that nagging thought, which is which would be undermining my effort in this area if I was always wondering about, man, while I'm working over here, is there other stuff happening over here that I... I'm wasting my time making money here when I could be making more money over there. So there is constantly a tension between your exploitation and your exploration. You got to have something like 80-20 once you get production systems that are working. In the early phases your time might be 80-20. As you are scouting rapidly in four areas, taking the best one that emerges and getting that into production where you're going to spend 80% of your money capital because you need 20% of your capital to fund the prototypes with real money so you can determine immediately if there's something in there now you could spend a lot of money on back testing and not trading live and come up with the best thing to start trading live but then you still have to operate at the prototype level to ensure that the live trading equals the money that you spent in back testing and getting those results or in simulations the best simulation of the market is the market so let's go Back test as much as you need in order to be confident that you've done enough work to start trading with skin in the game going forward on the most promising systems that you've been able to scout and looking to see how you take the one share trading and scale it up to where you are in full production. If you were not experiencing struggle and discontinuity in here, I'd be surprised because how you trade over here with some set of rules is going to be different than those. And every one of those is a new learning experience. And you're not just trying to learn the information and the concepts from an external source, but you're also trying to internalize that to yourself and you are displacing foundational beliefs over here with these new ideas and the fact that you're doing that is what's causing the feeling of struggle 
because you're genuinely doing the things that it takes to work at a deep level. So that is the least surprising thing when you're actually trying to acquire new professional knowledge. And that's why I say that learning model where you say, I am unconscious and I am conscious uh, and I am competent and I am incompetent that when you don't even know what your underperformance is, it's here because you're unconscious of it, of what you're missing. And then the first step of that is to move into conscious incompetence, which is you're thinking about it and you're aware of it and you're seeing suboptimal and you're seeing where the struggles are. And then you slowly, through practice, get better by a, the mindset of continuous improvement that allows you to begin to ratchet your performance up in measurable ways. And from that, the things that work the best, you start scaling into production only when you have evidence of competence so that you can lather, rinse, and repeat and then develop unconscious competence. So if that's the, that's the human learning model, this is how to scale with stewardship, which means proper respect and protection of the difficult to acquire capital to invest in systems. So the struggle is real because you're actually doing the work. So I don't even have to give you tips because what you did is what I was going to say. So now what I'm looking for as your coach, I'm looking at the trader who has accumulated this data I ha I'm looking to see what kind of rules and systems are you following and what kind of data did you get? What's your analysis of that data? And then as you incorporate knowledge of self, you say, next actions, do you have some of those things done and now what I can do as a coach is to see what kind of rules and systems are you getting what kind of data are you collecting was that the right data to capture did you pick a model a lens to look at your performance in order to perform the analysis the analysis should come to some conclusions is the analysis properly performed? In other words, are those conclusions justified? Do you have enough evidence? Did you apply the rules? Did you have standards and criteria? Did you incorporate knowledge of self into your actions? And then the actions that you are proposing, is there a golden thread that ties all this stuff together in a way that tells me you have adopted a coach's eye so that you can become self-directed? That not only have you adopted a professional trading mentality, but are you now capable of stepping outside of that and looking at your own performance dispassionately and giving good advice to yourself that you could give to somebody else who had all of this. If you do that, then you're developing the coaching eye. Now, the only way that you can do that in a way that survives contact with the world, that takes a serious person to do what I just described. The only way you can do that in a way that will maintain contact with the friction of the world, because the world will come in and crush you if you're not a serious person. It'll roll right over you, and it's coming. 
So as you propose to do things to move up that hill, the weight of the world is coming. And your knowledge has to be a wedge that allows us to take that energy of the world and reverse it and put it into action for us because we have a wedge that's supported by evidence and beliefs and systems that can turn that thing around. So as you give me this, I start evaluating what you sent me with that mindset. Well, I know that you're doing learning by doing because I see you doing the work every night. And I see that you are improving the assessment of your individual structure and you're making evidence-based decisions. I am presuming that you're putting all this in a learning journal, including your proposal for this. I'm going to make sure that you understand the difference between exploring and exploiting and why what you're doing on behalf of your daughter is that you are using a scouting model to quickly evaluate all of the things that I offer so that you can find the ones that fit best for you. It feels to me that you have explored enough areas that you are now prepared to do moving into production, which is the elimination of struggle. And we're going to replace it with efficiency and smoothness and friction-free. And we want to turn that into an industrial process. And the way you do that is system mapping. It's called value chain analysis. And you simply say, this is my process to go from A to B. I'm using this process and I can make that as efficient and effective and powerful through leverage and tools and performance so I can make this the return on investment of capital better. So value chain analysis starts with system mapping and then and you started that. Last week during the planning phase, I tabulate information from the daily report about various symbols to give me an estimate of what could be moving. Check. I prepare my stats on the chart. Check. I prepare about eight symbols, four primary and four subs. Check. You've reduced it to an actionable set. I'm going to say you need to now document how you find the movers. I already know that's an area that needs work because that's the most important one. Your action plan is stay away from the OR3s, correct? Because an OR3 simply allows you to exploit that first move out of the gate, whereas the SSC you already allow the other traders to have the first move. But when they make the biggest move out of your eight, you now know which one, one through eight, is the most that's in play. That information has value. Like, if it takes you 30 minutes to find out which one of your eight prepared targets or the top two or three are the ones that are in play. Or you just say, which of my eight have experienced a harsh winter in the first 30 minutes? Maybe the cost of that information is worth not trading them. Here's how you calculate that. What is my net performance of trying to trade with OR3 right from the get-go. If I don't trade OR3 right from the get-go, what am I giving up? Right now you would say, that's a price I'm willing to pay. I think. I don't know that until you tell me what the numbers are and you say, what are the stats on the OR3? So if I give that up in order to have the information of which ones are in play, 
what am I looking like from plus 30 to close minus 30? Because I'm going to suggest that you don't trade in the last 30 minutes. And now what you say is, I now am in a position to do research and to write a lab report in the form of artifacts, which are evidence. And on that basis, I can do continuous improvement using the principles of Deming and quality control. Artifacts and statistics allow you to develop next steps. So the lab reports that you need to have include what is the stats on the OR3, good, bad, and otherwise. If you were trying different strategies, you might say, hey, which patterns work better? But really, all you need to know is when I applied all those patterns to OR3, what was my net? What's my performance look like? Now let me set up with the same rigor. I think it takes more than a week. I think it takes a month. But it starts with the first week. So show me week one, two, three, and four. The same level of professionalism you used on OR3. Try it with your eight symbols. Use the first 30 minutes to come up with who's in play. Put that into performance by maybe trading two or three of them based on your feel. You already have enough information to decide what your effective span of control is. You already know that. You know that from trying to trade it in OR3, so you don't actually have to imagine what that's going to be up here. You already know that. That is one of the values that comes from the lab report that you're going to do on the OR3 time frame. You already know what your span of control is. Now you can do that to decide how to trade from 30 minutes onward. So how are you going to do that? I'm checking. I'm only going to take trades that qualify as patterns. SSC, SFC, CD, e, D, K2. Every one of those requires a harsh winter. I'm also going to tell you that a harsh summer is the same thing. Because all you needed was something that went huge enough in either direction to establish that, yeah, this is an abnormally good or an abnormally bad system. The ones I prefer are the ones that are abnormally bad because you know that you have fear in there. And when you see fear from half the population that lost the money, then you know you have greed from guys who made the money and guys who want to buy it on sale. So you get a double scoop of fear and a double scoop of greed. You also get the guys who have fear of missing out when that thing starts turning. So on everything that's a harsh winter, you get a double scoop of fear and greed that's going to drive the next move. It's not quite the same level of emotion when you have that. Because guys that made that money already feel content, and maybe they want the second one, but the guys who are working on the long side typically are easily satisfied compared to guys that are grinding down and around in here. So there's emotion up here, but there's more emotion from fear. We know that. So, and then the fake one go to is what you do after, only after everything settles into, at a minimum, the Z3P. I need you to start showing me that you remember that by drawing the frog box to straddle the Z3 pinch so that when you start waiting a period of time and then you start initiating in here that we can see by inspection that you have waited for the Z3P. So you got to do that. finding the movers, and all, you're, you're good to go. So if you do that, and you will, because you have skin in the game, uh, then you're going to be doing all of these things correctly. You're going to be using your scout mindset to investigate the 
plus 30. When you do that, I want you to think about at some point shifting a view to the 30 minute chart so that you start developing that mindset the same way that you see me doing every single night of my life and you're going to realize that the previous patterns that you see and now you have the first bar of the new day and you already know from the open where the range stat is you're going to find that you can while you're waiting for the next 30 minute bar you're going to be able to start thinking about that like this so that's a lab report when you decide to do that that now do you want to run all those experiments simultaneously I don't know there's a span of control on how much you can do but you'll know if you're doing it with the level of due diligence so you got to analyze the OR3 you got to plan and then set up that experiment for the open plus 30 on the one to eight movers and decide which ones you're going to try it's going to be informed by the span of control information that comes out of this study and then you're going to do this lab report at least in four stages for four weeks a week at a time and then you're going to compare week one to two to three to four as subsets to see if we're seeing evidence of improvement through continuous practice and then we're going to take a look at the overall set to see what a month of that looks like and the opportunity cost to you is that you're not getting you're not getting the money that you're earning from in here but that's not a big deal because we know already but if you hadn't done this you would not be in a position to ask these questions with the knowledge that you already have confirmed by doing at a professional level and the fact that you have already shown me through this that you are developing the coaching eye tells me that you can do this for yourself and present that information and I'm telling you that if you don't already plan to brief this in October during the live trading you're wrong because I'm gonna give you that one as a baby gift for free you that's what I'm gonna tell you and those are your next steps I think if you agree and that's everything I want to say on this one because we got to get this published and get ready for creativity 202 check or hold good thing I recorded that I don't want to have to say all that again don't make me say all that again because I will there you are all right fellas we'll see you shortly and the foundations guys of course you're invited to listen in on the creativity 202 if you wish no requirement to do so but you might enjoy it and I think that's let me get this um, done and I'll see you shortly cheers <laughs>